Just outside Truro in Cornwall, a dynamic new company is set up on the site of a former industrial giant. They've taken the crumbling buildings and sheds of the former Mount Wellington tin mine and turned them into modern workshops and offices. Kenza make ground source heat pumps here. They're one of a very small number of British companies doing this. This simple but ingenious heat exchange device draws on the heat stored in the earth to provide a highly efficient and sustainable heating system for buildings of all kinds. One local site was the Tolvadden Energy Park. It's been incredibly efficient. It, fit, it, it's, it heats a rather large building. Our offices are the largest on site. And people are always amazed at how efficient it is. And uh, it's been for us, when we move from an older office with an inefficient system, this has proved to be one of the most efficient systems you can have. Kenza is the brainchild of managing director Richard Freeborn. Kenza was formed by myself and our technical director in the late 1990s. We were both marine engineers. We knew a lot about heat pumps and the way they were used on uh, all sorts of small vessels. Essentially, all we did was bury a load of black plastic pipe, connect a heat pump up to it, and that heated a building. And really, that's as, as simple as it is. That's all there is to it. You can talk about the type of heat pump, the type of building, the amount of plastic pipe, but in its simplest form, that's all it is, a pile of plastic buried in the ground, connected up to the heat pump technology that we've developed. Kenza pride themselves on the quality of their product. They have a dedicated workforce who've produced over a thousand systems for a wide variety of different building types and sizes. I think the technology suits all types of modern buildings as well as those existing buildings that can be insulated to the required standard. There are huge opportunities within the commercial building sector and we're already seeing some significant sales, particularly to the school building programme. Because of their size and location, Kenza cannot install every pump themselves. Instead, they've designed their systems to be as user-friendly as possible. They can be fitted by any qualified heating engineer. This is an important selling point in their business development. Now we've been very particular about that because we're very keen that whoever installs it also commissions it. We don't like specialist people going around and commissioning our products. We'd rather make the products so simple that people can commission them themselves. So that's a challenge because they will have never seen a heat pump before. They don't know what a ground array is. We have to hold their hand until they've got it in and it's working and they actually walk away with a good feeling about that at the end of the job. Kenza are making great progress, but what are the challenges for them in the future? Kenza are the only British manufacturer of a full range of ground source heat pumps, so we supply into all sorts of different markets, everything from schools, hospitals and housing, and within those there's all sorts of subsets. For example, in the housing sector, we do a lot of work with local authorities and housing associations, right through to people who are doing a, a, a barn conversion or a self-build. Now, we're seeing growth in all of those markets, and some are going to move faster than others. We think, actually... That the, the social housing market is probably going to be the fastest mover. Well, I think uh, there will be some very substantial growth. The government has already announced the need for zero carbon residential homes by 2016, and that will drive the market. So it's a challenge for us to decide where we put our resources in terms of marketing and also which models are going to be more popular. Is it going to be lots and lots of very small heat pumps that will go into uh, mass social housing, or are we looking at huge plant room units? So it's a big challenge for us but we're, we supply into all those markets and we're certainly capable of keeping pace with the market growth. OK, and I'd like to now to introduce Richard Freeborn who will um, talk about the work of Kenza. Thank you. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Richard Freeborn. Uh, I'm the chairman of uh, Kenza Engineering. I just want to run through a few slides, explain, first of all, how we started... Um, we started with marine heat pumps. Uh, we had an R&D phase prior to 1999, and we developed that uh, into one of the Europe's largest ranges of ground source heat pumps. We've applied them into houses, schools, hospitals, and particularly the RNLI. Every RNLI lifeboat that's launched has a Kenza heat pump on it. does all the heating, cooling, ventilation, dehumidification. Very tough market, that, because the heat pumps have to work upside down. and have to take a 6G shock loading, so putting one in a school is really very easy compared to a lifeboat. Have we progressed? Well, one of the overriding principles is that we do everything ourselves. We have a very loyal and talented staff and their stakeholders. Virtually everybody in the company, once they've been there, well, everyone who's been there a year uh, has a stakeholder, has an option to buy shares. 
We have an ethical promotion of the technology. We're very, very interested in the way it's applied. Our technical director won't care how old, whether our, whether our heat pump is one year old, five years old, ten years old. It has to work. He doesn't care how old it is. But also, it's got to be applied properly. There's no point, point in buying a heat pump if you've got unrealistic expectations or if you're putting it into a leaky old building and expecting it to be as efficient as in a new building. We're very ruthless on value engineering. We drive everything out of the product that we don't need in terms of cost. We've got very strong strategic relationships with energy companies, uh, installers, plumbing companies, heating engineers, and also some of the big boiler manufacturers. You'll see our products appear with some uh, household names on the front. We actually make them uh, on a badge engineering basis. In terms of the products, that's what a domestic heat pump would look like. It's about that big. Not terribly big, same size as a fridge really, works on the same principle. There's one installed in a utility room. You can uh, see it's just a, just a white box. Like right, going to a house like that, that's where that, one, that particular one comes. It's a single compressor heat pump, which means it's got one compressor inside it. Now, up at the uh, back in where you go for a coffee break, you'll see some bits of a compressor. You can see what it's like inside. Uh, so that's a single compressor heat pump. Back 12 kilowatts in single phase, 16 kilowatts in, in three phase. So you can do really quite a large house with that. All the models we make can also heat hot water, although we'd always recommend that you use solar panels to heat hot water rather than a heat pump as a, as a primary source. They can also give cooling if that's a requirement. We send a lot of stuff now, particularly into Spain, and also we've sent some stuff to Greece as well. Then the next size up, uh, this would be, uh, uh, you'd do a small primary school. That particular school is Olden School in the Isle of Man. Uh, and the ground arrays are actually dug in with a digger underneath that playground, so the heat source is actually underneath the playground. That's another school you can see where the ground arrays are dug in in the playing field. So a compact, is a, this is a twin compressor heat pump, so it's double the power output uh, of the previous one. A 24 kilowatt, that's the largest heat pump that you can get in the world on single phase. That's giving you 24 kilowatts of heat. Three quarters of that heat will come from the school playing field. The remaining quarter, the other 25%, will come from the electricity supply go even larger in three phase. And again, all the models can heat hot water if, if that's what you want, although if you're perhaps retrofitting it into an old school, hot water heating is probably not a big part of your energy bill. It's going to be space heating that's the problem. Again, you can have cooling. Some of them we put in technology co colleges uh, have cooling for the computer room and things like this. Then we do the big ones. This is at the Smart Life Center, Cambridge, a uh, big uh, regional college. And you can see uh, the plant room has been made a feature of here. It's all glass. Uh, and uh, every now and then the students go out and they take the temperatures. They're a modular design, they bolt together up to 75 kilowatts a module, and we've got a 150 kilowatt module in development. We're doing Heartlands Hospital at the moment, for example. There's literally no size of building that we cannot heat with this technology and with the products that we have. Some give heating and cooling. As you tend to get bigger, office buildings often need cooling, and that, that's ground source cooling. What's inside a heat pump? Well, I, I just put this together for you just to give an idea. That's the compressor, that's the core that uh, black cylinder there at the back. There is uh, two heat exchangers in it, two water pumps, one for the ground, one for the underfloor heating system, a couple of pressure gauges, and a controller. That's really all there is inside it. In terms of ground arrays, that's a, a slinky, as it's called, being put in. The pipe slinks along the trench. It's a two-meter deep trench, dug with the narrowest digger bucket. You put the pipe in, put the earth back on top. That's all you need to do. If you want to drill, you can. That's the end of a drilling bit. And that's a, a drilling operation in process. That's a very small drilling rig that will actually go through the back garden, uh, a back garden gate of a house. And this is actually in a social house. So this is a, a relatively small housing association house. Um, we've done about 80 of those on this particular job. And that drilling rig is capable of going up to 100 meters. So it's a, when it's finished, you wouldn't know it was there. You just connect the heat pump up to it. That's a, a schematic, just shows you how it goes. That's a, a horizontal slinky system. You can see the pipes connect up to a manifold on the wall and then into the heat pump. Where are we now? Well, that's our, our manufacturing, uh, manufacturing facility. Uh, we've moved to a large freehold site. It's a big one. The volumes are increasing, and we're adapting to a mainstream market. We have professional sales and marketing that's now in place. Where will Kenza be? More manufacturing, focus on reducing the carbon in the heat pumps, keeping pace with the market, and emphasizing our relationships. In McCuntleth in West Wales is one of Britain's longest established renewable energy companies. 
Dulles Engineering has been around since 1982 and is involved in a wide variety of schemes including hydro, wind power and biomass. Dulles is quite uh, different, I think, from a conventional company in that all the people that work at Dulles uh, become shareholders and therefore owners of the company. Dulles is a unique kind of company. It's a family setup. They all eat lunch together every day. But it's not a hippy-dippy business. They're a highly professional outfit and mindful of their competitors in an expanding marketplace. Some of their projects are on the doorstep, like this biomass heating installation at the local National Park Visitor Center at Nantararian. Dillis's involvement here is as the designer installer of a biomass system. We actually own the system and we run it as an ESCO, so we're the energy supply company. For the client, it's a totally hands-free system. The boiler runs automatically. The only thing they know about it is a, is a bill they get through based on the metered heat that they use. The wood chip fuel is considered carbon neutral because the trees absorb the carbon during their lifetime and as long as you replace the trees after you've used the fuel then uh, it, it's a sustainable and renewable system where the future trees absorb the carbon that's just been recently emitted. Dulles don't just design and build systems, they also recondition existing schemes like this 400 kilowatt river hydro plant at nearby Irwuch. This is a classic refurbishment job. We've improved it and we've refurbished the turbine, we've rebuilt the intake, just to get the thing running on how it should be, really. These are our uh, Coanda screens. Um, they're intake screens that we sell all over the world, mainly for hydro intakes. The way they work, the, um, the water flows really fast over this curved part, and the screen material is um, the flat face we see along the front, and filling up the chamber underneath. Now at the moment the turbine's at full power, so the spare water's gone through the screens and it's actually coming back out of the bottom again. Over the past five years, Dulles have been responsible for the installation and refurbishment of seven megawatts of hydro capacity. Their approach is advanced and allows remote control and fault diagnosis, as well as making the systems easy to use for the local operator. Dulles are involved in numerous schemes around Wales and the UK, but some of their work is for much farther flung places like these solar-powered fridges for vaccine storage. 25 years ago, Dulles made the first because we really wanted to help the poorest of the poor people around the world. We have the solar refrigerator itself, which has got very, very thick insulation, which minimises the amount of electricity that is required. Then the sun shines on a solar module like this. This solar energy is then converted into electricity and stored in a battery. And then the solar fridge uses the electricity from the battery. So in the night, when it's not sunny, the solar fridge will still be working. It will be continually working and continually keeping everything cold. These fridges play a vital part in disease control and Dulles estimates that they currently supply 75% of the total market. Now we're supplying thousands and thousands every year, which might go to remote areas in Sudan or Nigeria, or anywhere in Africa, also South America all over the world. Back in the UK, Dulles are experts in identifying and getting planning permission for potential wind farm sites. This local scheme at Chemice was the first to be granted permission in Wales and has energy benefits for the local community. We basically have designed various approaches to finding wind farm sites and then designing them using geographical information systems but also our deep technical knowledge of how wind farms and wind energy schemes work. Um, to get the approvals for the wind farms, which is why Dulles has ended up with such a good and high success rate. I would say at any one time we might have between 15 and 25 different wind farm schemes, early feas feasibility or site finding, right the way through to detailed design, in planning or at appeal. Um, so I think we've got around between 500 and 600 megawatts currently in the planning system waiting to be determined. The thing about Dulles is we want to be a business that it's good to do business with. And one of the challenges is to try and keep that family atmosphere around the company, to, to keep ethical, um, but also to compete in a very fast-changing industry. I'd like to welcome Ian Drazy from Dulles to tell you more about their work.
Thank you very much, Anne, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I feel, actually, I do feel extremely humbled by the presentations and demonstrations I've seen. And you, get, you can, you're going to need a hook to get me off because everything I've seen um, today relates to what Dulles does. Um, I think really we're responding. Dulles has always been a responding company. We've been well, about, you can tell we've been, been Dulles Engineering actually for 14 years. Um, but things don't change that quickly in our industry, or at least they haven't until recently. But now there's policy drivers, um, there's uh, local drivers, local legislation, regulation, everything is changing in our industry. Um, and now with oil prices as they are, there are drivers, international drivers, that are changing our focus almost on a monthly basis. Some things that don't change, though, is our vision um, and the values that drive the people that work at Dulles and the people that continue, thankfully, to join Dulles um, and become shareholders and take an equal value in the company. I think that's very important. Our vision is to improve people's lives through renewable energy and sustainable technology. So everything we do has a positive impact, whether it's directly in overseas markets with vaccine blood banking fridges that you saw about, or whether it's just a, a small one kilowatt solar domestic system, everything we do and touch has a positive impact. We're now one of the biggest of the little boys, if you know what I mean, with uh, 50 people um, and approaching a 10 million pound turnover, uh, but we're still a minnow compared to the interests now in the renewable energy market. Uh, key achievements, by me, there seem to be so many I couldn't possibly list them in five minutes, but I've put some headlines down there. Um, and the, the thing is, we do operate in lots of different technologies. And that's a result of personal interest. Dillis likes to empower people to do what they want to do, to be able to operate in technologies or areas of business. And if they can be successful and profitable, then Dillis will put resource to it and make it that way. I think the need for informed, responsible professionals in the renewable energy industry is coming to a fore. And we backed down, we backed away from some of the technical and building consultancy um, some years ago. But we're back there now because we see that there's a niche and a need for an impartial, um, honest broker almost, who isn't technology dependent to give good advice to those who don't know what the best solution might be for their particular problem or um, application. And through that, we're developing some really important customer partnerships. Um, and if all the advice that we adopt is taken over the last couple of years, then we're talking about hundreds of thousands of tons of CO2 being offset with on-site microgeneration, which is something really to look forward to. Also, our key achievements, I think, uh, I think, are things that we've contributed to, like large-scale immunization programs. We're responsible for the, for the whole of the cold chain in Sierra Leone. That's delivering polio and measles vaccinations um, to the whole population. And it's our fridges that are keeping them cold and, uh, and keeping their integrity. And that's something that we're all very proud of. Even if we don't work in that area of the business, it's something that we can hang our hat on. Um, and... I would echo what Roger Wood said earlier, it is humbling, um, but working in the developing uh, world is, is, a, is a major driver to everybody at Dulles. And what I would add there is that NGO procurement now is changing from being who's got the cheapest product at the specification that's met, to sustainability now is increasingly being considered. So fuel supply to generating systems is, is really key. Uh, you heard about our hydropower schemes, and we do own and operate a number of schemes that we've taken an interest in. Um, and we're, we work all over the world again. We've had projects in Kenya, um, I can, in, in India, Nepal, obviously, but also more, more now, more and more, we're working closer to home in Wales and Scotland as the value for renewable energy increases. But in the UK, we really hit the big time by, uh, well, it's, we're perceived to have hit the big time by becoming a framework supplier in the low-carbon building program. Our bid was based on technical excellence, high quality, the ability to deliver, but above all, education. And think back to what those schools are doing. We've spent uh, thousands and thousands of pounds on building a teaching pack that will help bring education, micro-generation, into the classrooms without additional resource from the teachers. 
Uh, in terms of managing billets, or rather technical, I've talked about technical, um, we're, we're good at tapping into the cash that's available locally to us in Wales. Um, and we, we, we do think it helps us grow and retain staff, the fact that we share our profits. We manage ourselves. We choose directors to manage the business from within the employees. Um, but that doesn't compromise our ethos and commitment to work together with the local community and helping the poorest of the poor. We've come from one little shed to a big shed, and we also try and do as much charity work as we can in our local community. Thanks very much. Okay, just say that the question is about the challenges in working in overseas markets. Well, I think actually I'm going to echo what Richard said in his presentation. It's all about simplicity. Um, and of course, renewable energy here is all about carbon, and it's all about corporate social responsibility at the moment. Uh, but it now increasingly, it's about education and energy offset and cost reduction. Overseas, it's only about one thing. It's about appropriate technology. Um, and that, that's one of our core values. And so we try and design our systems to be as simple and as robust. Sometimes the fridges have to travel for hundreds of miles on the back of a high, I know, a Hilux pickup, uh, which can be quite difficult. And engineering out problems that we found, like the wheels bouncing through the chassis when they were delivered, when they were dropped on the floor on the back of the truck. Simple things like that that can be engineered out in time. Thank you. Uh, um, yes, Roger. Council. Um, my ignorance, but so yes, sure. Well, we... we we were the first uh, company to manufacture and develop air source heat pumps, uh, but they're not sold with our branding on. So we were the originators of air source heat pumps in the UK. They have a, a, a place to play. They're, they're generally not as efficient as ground source heat pumps. They're essentially, they uh, you, you don't need any drilling. That's, that's the, the great advantage. No di drilling, no digging. So as such, it sounds like a great idea, but like most great ideas, there are some drawbacks. They're not as efficient. When the air gets very cold, they can struggle. Um, what we are finding is that although our heat pumps that we've developed are very, very uh, carefully sold, they're designed to go outside social housing to compete with coal and electric storage heaters. Other salesmen have got hold of the technology and they're going out telling some amazing fairy stories about what air source heat pump technology can do that frankly doesn't stand up to it. So we're lucky we kept our branding quite well away from air source heat pumps and I think there are probably some not very nice stories to come out about them. Uh, and, but there's nothing wrong with this technology, good technology, it's the word application, if it's applied correctly, it's good technology. Th there is, but there's an application issue, and for example, if you're going to put it into a social house, if you put it, an air source heat pump on the ground outside a social house, the next door neighbour has the human right to sleep with their bedroom window open, and they're not allowed to hear the heat pump. That's a huge technical challenge. The only way around that is to make the heat pump very large, very bulky, and very expensive to the point where it's more expensive than just simply putting a ground source heat pump in. So, uh, and and th there's no real solution to that. If you want lots of air moving without much noise, you've got to have something big. And so you priced yourself out of the market. And so you'd go back to a ground source, which would be the cheaper option. Also, in terms of, car terms of carbon emissions reduction, which is what the funding will come from from the energy companies, if you drill a ground array in, it's going to last 50 or 100 years whereas an air source heat pump is maybe just 15 years, so you get a much greater credit. So therefore, the grant funding for ground source heat pumps is maybe 10 times what you get for an air source heat pump in many situations. So if you had the money, you'd put the ground source heat pump in. That's, that's the end of the story, really. Okay, that's a refrigerant in the ground source heat pumps. Uh, well, we use a refrigerant that's uh, non-ozone depletion at all, so there's no ozone depletion potential at all. It's called uh, R407C and it's a, a man-made gas. Uh, in terms of leaks, if, if our technical director was here, he'd be s sitting here saying, what leaks? There shouldn't be any leaks. Uh, there are no field connections into the refrigeration system. It's a factory-sealed system. You could ask the same as a, of your fridge at home. You know, how many of your fridges leak refrigerant out of your fridge? The answer is, well, pretty near none. So in theory, it shouldn't happen. If it does happen, it's benign, and you can actually breathe it. Uh, and it's a very small quantity, so it, it's not a particular issue. It, in fact, it's a, to be honest, it's a bit of a dull topic unless you want to go into uh, you know, the, the, the characteristics of different refrigerants. We have done, uh, just completed a European uh, R&D program, European-wide, on using natural refrigerants, and the one we chose was propane uh, and butane, a mixture of the two, which is completely natural. It's, abs uh, it's, it's not man-made at all. And the results for that are actually better than a man-made refrigerant. Propane and butane together, which are natural refrigerants, are better than man-made refrigerants. But the problem is they're flammable. So that's why they're more dangerous to use. 
Okay, this is about using um, something like a phase change material to absorb heat and retain, maintain temperature and comfort indoors. Um, the, the answer is for cooling, you can certainly use phase change salts and you can use uh, low carbon electricity to uh, charge those salts up with cooling and you can certainly do that. In terms of heating, most of the buildings we do have underfloor heating uh, with a layer of, of uh, screed and that screed is your thermal store. So, uh, I mean, for example, if you take you know, a, a new house that's got an underfloor heating, the heat pump, say, starts at midnight, which is the start of off-peak electricity. You don't wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning saying, geez, it's hot in here, isn't it? You, know, you can't tell. And all you're doing is gradually charging that up over many, many hours. So it's built into the building structure already. Okay, this is a fairy godmother question. So it's, it's what fairy godmother would you like for the UK to expand take-up of these technologies, and what would you like internationally? Well, I'd encourage you to put your wand down and pick up a big stick and start thumping people um, <laughs> in, that are making policy decisions um, in, 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 in Parliament because our, our policy isn't strong enough to encourage um, the adoption of green technology, green energy and, sus and sustainability. It's not, we're not giving it enough um, room to maneuver, we're not being creative enough in our policy making, so I think a little bit of a stick whacking around there would, would, is what I would ask for. Um, well, what I'd do is I would first start by solving fuel poverty. Um, it's a scandal that we have so many excess winter deaths in this country, and this winter it's going to be really bad, especially for those with, with oil central heating. So eradicate fuel poverty, which is a legal requirement. It's got to be done by 2010 according to statute. Once you've done that, the easy way to have a huge take-up in renewables is simply to double the price of oil again. Okay, well, that sounds suspiciously like a marketing question, and I'm, I'm an engineer, but I'll, I'll try and answer it. Um, yes, uh, in terms, if you're referring to grant funding, uh, grant funding is only available to homeowners under the Low Carbon Buildings Programme. However, under the CERT funding, uh, it's, it's really house occupants, so that's much more generous. In terms of getting to people, it, it, it's kind of interesting, because when you start looking at, at fuel poverty, which is really where, where, where you're looking here, um, you know, Every local authority and housing association has in the country has probably had its cavities filled and the roof insulated. However, fuel poverty is probably an old lady living in a third of a million pound bungalow by the seaside who's a pensioner. Now, how do you get to her? That's very, very difficult. That's where fuel poverty is these days, and that's very difficult. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, the very final part of our seminar today focuses on the charity and community sector, um, an absolutely key driving force in the environment, in fuel poverty, in sustainability in the UK. So we'll start first of all with Global Action Plan in London. Question, how many bankers does it take to power a light bulb? Answer, more than one if you want enough light to read more than a page of a financial report. Julian Pottergill cycles for pleasure, but right now he's struggling to generate the energy required to power just one light bulb or two. Uh, yeah, I've just been uh, riding an energy bike, and uh, what it does is it shows how much energy, as you can tell, I would use to power a normal everyday appliance. Whoa. <laughs> The message is clear. There aren't enough hard cycling bankers in London to keep the lights on even for one day in a typical city office. This is just one of the devices employed by Global Action Plan, who emphasise practical methods to get their message about energy conservation into the heart of big corporations. Global Action Plan founder Truin Resterick explains how he got started and why he chooses such methods to get the message across. 
So I started Global Action Plan in 1993. Uh, I moved from Friends of the Earth where I was responsible for their marketing and fundraising. And the reason I did it was I wanted to create an organisation that was about practical change. Traditionally, environmentally groups have not been great at communicating. It's tended to be small font on grey paper saying, do this or do that. And we found that people want to receive messages in different ways. So we've created interactive tools. We have a, a carbon torture chamber, which has an energy bike, which people pedal so they can feel the amount of energy used by different appliances. And we've got a green driving game which challenges you to drive as far as you can on a small amount of petrol. Uh, this is called the Eco Driving Simulator um, and it's uh, simulated to try and promote green driving through sort of simple messages like encouraging people to change gear at low revs and also encouraging people to anticipate so when you see a junction approaching what you look to do is try and slow down in advance rather than using brakes. Your revs so it's very simple speed. messages um, and communicated to audiences that aren't traditionally reached through uh, environmental messaging generally. Translating the message into a language corporations can deal with are business project officers like Charlotte High. I'm on the programmes team that works with uh, large businesses, um, our environment champions teams, and we run projects with larger businesses to help them reduce their environmental impact, so very practical projects. It's about engaging staff throughout the organisation um, and changing behaviour. GAP focus their efforts on key areas of energy saving, like switching off appliances. We had already started on the environmental path. We had um, started to recycle our, as much waste as we possibly could. We started to measure and monitor our energy and our water waste. And then GAP came in and helped. We had the passion, but we didn't particularly have the know-how. So I think we made a good team. Waste reduction and recycling are important parts of Global Action Plan strategy. First, they recruit a team inside the client organisation. The project started um, through the process of recruiting a, a green team, or a team of environment champions, um, and uh, we ran some initial training sessions with this, this team of champions and really got them to feed into the project um, what they thought would work at Investec um, and what we thought would work. For example, the green team came up with the idea of illustrating the amount of paper that gets used in the uh, offices, which is a huge amount, by building a giant tower out of empty boxes, which they um, set up in the atrium. The paper pile was a huge success. Not only was it a potent symbol, it generated a lot of conversation in the organisation, conversation that spilled out of the walls of Investec and into the streets of London Square Mile. And the staff have taken to it very well. Um, we, we came in slowly and um, now everybody, I think, knows about us pr pretty well. Uh, the whole model has been well received and it is now being rolled out throughout our other global offices uh, within Investec. The key message we've got from running this project at Investec is that uh, we've been able to demonstrate to other financial institutions as well that we talk to that working on the environment or running a project on the environment that involves staff doesn't have to be something that's fluffy or perhaps draconian even, um, but it can be something that really fits into the way they work um, and we've had a lot of interest from other financial institutions as a result. Global Action Plan's methods achieve impressive results, a reduction of up to 25% in energy use and 34% in waste across the organisations they've worked with since 1997. Companies are realising that they've really got to address the climate change issue and they're looking to do that in more innovative ways. And Global Action Plan is going to try and help them do that. For example, helping their staff to volunteer in the community on climate change issues. And our plans are, over the next few years, to work with more and more companies in different sectors, helping them to get this message across in a much stronger manner. I'd like to introduce Turin Resterich, who will talk further about the work of GAP. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you should be getting the award for sitting through this marathon of presentations uh, and also to have my huge face staring at you at the end of it is probably not a great, great way to go towards the end of the day. So um, right. I just want to say about Global Action Plan. I think we're slightly different from some of the presentations you've had earlier in that we're really all about um, getting people to change their behaviour. And we, we operate on the ethos that many, many, many small changes at work, at home, at school, and in the wider community do make a difference. And we work with Ringwall School, who you heard about earlier, about creating the structures and giving people the space and, and the enthusiasm to enable them to implement change within their organisation. 
Um, the Environment Champions program uh, came about because we were actually approached by a company, um, it was British Gas actually, who had an environmental policy which they felt was very outward facing. They, they admitted it was mainly used to defend their position against pressure groups and to inform stakeholders and shareholders about what they were doing. Um, so they wanted actually to develop something that, that would create change within the business and use the energy enthusiasm within their staff. Um, so we're about helping companies cut carbon, reduce waste, um, and get more involved in informed staff. To date, 69 organisations have participated, ranging from uh, the Guild Guide Association right the way through to one of those really big, nasty hedge funds, um, and, and many banks and local authorities en route. So a whole variety of organisations. Um, and you can see there the number of people uh, who volunteered and the, the CO2 that the programme has saved. But I want to concentrate mainly on, on the process and how do you create change in organisations. And uh, I think the description I use is that organisations are a bit like, say, a, a school assembly or even a, a church congregation. You know, so the pianist or the organist starts up and there's silence. And then one or two people start singing. And they usually start singing very loudly and it's usually off key. But once they start singing, that gives the others in the congregation or the assembly the confidence to start joining in and singing as well. And then you always get the people at the back who just mind their way through the whole thing. So what we try and find in any organisation is those enthusiasts and those champions. Um, we want the singers in the organisation. And once we've recruited them, we then can give them the space, the ideas, the encouragement to come up with things like that, that paper towel. I just want to give you one quick example of another company. They wanted people to turn off their monitors. Stickers didn't work. Decrease in management didn't work. So they came up with the idea of, of carbon angels and carbon devils. And the volunteers one night went around the whole company and attached balloons to all the computers. Red devil ones for the computers that had been left on and gold uh, angel ones for the ones that had been turned off. And they didn't tell people why. Then they started working out the CO2 that used and the amount of energy that used. And then they repeated the process again and they repeated it again. And gradually the organisation changed its behaviour and there were gold balloons everywhere. And I just think that shows that you can shift values in organisations and you can get people engaged if you use fairly creative uh, methods of communication and if you measure. So measurement is crucial throughout our whole process. And finally, we think it's absolutely essential that you reward and thank people for what they've done. We've seen a huge number of uh, initiatives within companies where they have set up a green team, but they haven't given them any structural process. And as soon as they hit some obstacles, they find it hard to do things and, and you lose all that energy. But if you give them a clear process and at the end of it, you reward them and thank them and show them the impacts of their efforts, it makes a real difference. And we're very lucky that UNEP have endorsed our activities so all the companies get, get prize, uh, a UNEP certificate for their employees. And here's just some pictures of the groups of champions together, the, the, the torture chamber. And we actually get staff to go through their bins, which is quite interesting. Because whenever you go into a business, they say, oh, yes, we've got fantastic recycling facilities. When you actually go through the bins, you find that virtually nobody's using them as they're intended. Uh, that's our paper towel bottom uh, corner. We've got the, uh, the, the, the champions there receiving their certificates. It's not just about cutting carbon. It's about cutting waste, getting staff involved, changing habits, and we've had uh, experiences of people changing habits at home as well as work through this program. I just want to very quickly to finish off with our future developments. Um, we're very honoured to be shortlisted, and thank you to Ashton for that. Um, if, we, if we win the main award or if we any, win any, any of the money, then, then we're going to be just developing a new transport module. We're very keen to look at green IT, because the IT sector has the same carbon footprint virtually as the aviation sector. And we're looking to disseminate what we do through breakfast seminars and to extend the program to volunteering in other parts of the community. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Trin. Um, our final presentation of the day, going um, as far north as we are going, is to the Energy Agency in Ayrshire in South Scotland. Scotland's world-famous natural beauty has a power all of its own, wind power. Hadyard Hill, developed and built by the Scottish and Southern Energy Group, capitalises on the power of the wind in style. 52 70 metre high turbines offer an installed capacity of 120 megawatts. 
but no less impressive has been how the community benefit fund from the wind farm has been used to improve energy efficiency in the local area. The Energy Agency was an initiative that we set up 10 years ago now um, with the help of European funding. It was as a result of our uh, efforts to try and improve the energy efficiency and reduce carbon emissions in the domestic housing sector within South Ayrshire. The project started in uh, December 2006 with uh, thermal images to show householders where the major heat losses were in their household. Uh, we then used that to persuade them to sign up for the free insulation measures on offer. We had a choice to make in terms of how to use the Community Benefit Fund and it made perfect sense to us to use it for energy efficiency measures in the area. We were already using the wind farm to produce green energy at Hadjart Hill, so to complement that on the demand side of the equation with using the Community Benefit Fund for green measures made perfect sense to us. Keith and Beryl Daudry were early adopters of the Energy Agency scheme. Idyllically located in a small valley below the Hadjard Hill turbines, their former schoolhouse was nevertheless a classic hard-to-heat property. The rooms that were in were old classrooms uh, and no, no insulation whatsoever in here. A Victorian building, 150 years old. Uh, and so here we thought essentially to have uh, loft insulation in the roof space here. Uh, we had uh, became aware of the fact that there was an energy saving fund which Scottish and Southern were uh, enabling three community council areas affected by the wind farms would be able to receive. Uh, we had all the loft insulation done in the studios uh, and the ancillary rooms in here and also the, in the house we had that beefed up as well to modern day standards. Um, and almost from the outset you'd notice the difference. You would walk in and the, the residual heat, for instance, from the kilns or just from the heating from the day before, was still evident where before it had just disappeared. Across the valley in Bar, Mr and Mrs Peter Torbett explain how they were able to take advantage of the energy agency's management of the energy fund and transform their home too. Uh, about two years ago, we had the opportunity to put in solar panel heating and because there was a grant towards it, we decided to, to investigate the matter. And so therefore we did. Since we put in a solar panel, uh, we're going to save energy in heating the water, especially during the summer months. But even already, we have enough hot water to do us for the whole day. We think we've saved about £200 over the last year. The energy agency were the people who instigated the whole thing. They were the people who wrote the original letter and it was they who offered the first grant. The real benefits of this type of project is that it's directed at everybody in the community so that everyone benefits. If you have projects directed either at the few poor or particularly rich private homeowners, then you don't tend to get everybody benefiting. And to have a real community project, everyone has to see a benefit for themselves. And that, I think, has been one of the major successes of this type of project. Over 60% of the homes that the Energy Agency surveyed have had insulation measures installed. These children at Bar Primary School aren't just getting more comfortable homes, they're also benefiting from the Energy Agency's management of the energy fund. In the school playground, a game developed by the agency is underway. It's a game on electricity and how to save it. One, two, she gives you a question, then you have to answer it, and if you get it right, you get some money, and if you get it wrong, you don't get anything. The game teaches the next generation of Ayrshire Lowlanders how to be energy efficient and how best to manage the planet's resources. They take winning very seriously, but they're also learning valuable lessons. And the message is clearly sinking in. Without the lessons on this, um, the future would be bleak for people and um, you, people would have to pay millions to sort out the damage that they've done just now. And having demonstrated these successes with the Hadyard Hill Energy Fund project, the Energy Agency believe they've created a model that can be replicated across Scotland and beyond. There are now several projects that are following the template which has been shown to work in this area. Govan is a particular local example where there is a larger population base, a lot more houses, 
and the uptake is extremely good in that area. We see this as a major way to promote sustainability and have an impact across Ayrshire, Scotland and the rest of the UK. We have a target of eliminating fuel poverty by the year 2016 and the Energy Agency will be major players in ensuring that we reach that target. Okay, Liz Marquis and Michael Carr from the Energy Agency will tell us more about the work in the film. Good afternoon. Sounds quite echoey here. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. I hope you find our presentation informative and see the potential for how this model can be developed elsewhere. I'm Liz Marquis, Director of the Energy Agency, and today you will also hear from Michael Carr, our project manager. Our presentation describes... Is that one on? Yeah. Describes how the Energy Agency, together with Scottish and Southern Energy, a major utility company, and South Ayrshire Council, touched the lives of people in four rural villages through investing a wind to improve farm. their energy efficiency. The green dot on the map is where the wind farm is located. We represent the Energy Agency, a registered charity that has for almost 10 years provided free, impartial, expert advice on energy e efficiency, renewable energy and sustainable issues with the objective of reducing carbon dioxide emissions. We cover southwest Scotland, shown in red on the map. It is standard practice for commercial wind farms to set aside an annual sum of money for local communities to invest as they see fit. In this project, Scottish and Southern Energy set aside an additional lump sum of £300,000 with the provision that it was spent specifically on energy efficiency. A steering group was established to oversee the project. The membership was made up from representatives of the council and various community groups. This helped to overcome any local resistance to how and where the money was spent, as it gave a forum for any issues to be addressed. It was at this time that the post of project manager was advertised and Michael joined the energy agency. To say that, that I hit the ground running would be a bit of an understatement. Uh, in my first week, I sent out 800 letters uh, and coordinated the thermal imaging of properties in the community around the wind farm. Over the next couple of months, I met with community groups and the steering committee to agree the approach, negotiated with insulation contractors, appointed and trained surveyors, and worked with the local media to raise awareness in the community, culminating with a launch event in the village hall. The surveyors then went door to door, gathering data to calculate energy ratings and ecological footprints for the households, and to determine whether they were suitable for the free cavity wall, loft insulation and draft proofing that was on offer. Without grants, just for information, loft and cavity wall insulation each cost £500 for the average house. So, what was the outcome here, you ask? Over 90% of the community were actively involved in this project and received energy efficiency advice. 63% of those that were surveyed benefited from the free insulation. Just to put these numbers in perspective, the Energy Agency runs discounted insulation projects where those that are on government benefit get free insulation and the able to pay sector have to contribute about £100 for each measure. The uptake for these projects is about 10%. While the data gathered, as you can see there, indicates significant improvements in energy efficiency and reductions in carbon emissions, there was another more tangible element to the project that's not on the slide. Over a quarter of households in Scotland are in fuel poverty, where more than 10% of their income is spent heating the home. This is three times the UK average. And the main factors are the Scottish climate, uh, rural properties not being in the main gas network, and lower income with a higher proportion of elderly population. In fact, our survey found out that the average fuel bill in the community that we were working in was 40% higher than the UK average. 
The fuel savings from the insulation measures alone have lifted 13% of households out of fuel poverty. And the provision of income maximisation advice uh, or a benefit check has increased income of successful applicants by over 50%. You saw in our film that local schools were involved with solar panels and energy lesson, lessons. And we also saw earlier the two inspiring presentations from Ringmer and Sand Hills. The depth of knowledge of these pupils that demonstrated uh, should reassure us all that the decision makers and facilitators for change for our future are already on the right track. Information from a questionnaire that we issued indicated that over 80% of households, perhaps under pressure from their children, said that they would change their behaviour to further reduce energy consumption. And we're also interested in installing micro-renewable measures. I'll jump to the last bullet point on the next slide because I'm getting the hurry up. We're now looking to set up a micro-renewable rental scheme to overcome the high capital costs that some of our international colleagues also identified as a barrier to a sustainable community. And in our rehearsal, we had 30 seconds left here, so if you bear with me, while we're indebted to Scottish and Southern Energy and South Ayrshire Council for their funding and support to make this project possible, now that we've developed this approach to tackle energy efficiency and fuel poverty, it can be replicated with other sources of funding. The Energy Agency is already running three new projects with three different sources of funding to create warmer, more fuel affordable and sustainable communities. There are many more opportunities to extend this further. Thanks for listening. We're happy to take part in the questions. Okay, thank you very much. Can we have any questions to either GAP or the Energy Agency? Yes, here. The sort of champions we're looking for are people within an organisation that want to create change. Uh, we're looking for those people who are in a position to create change, like facilities managers, uh, even people who look after the canteens, just basically people who are involved in the infrastructure of the organisation. And we look for people who are representative from across the entire organisation so that we have a, a good reach. Um, how we recruit the, the champions varies completely from organisation to organisation. Um, and one of the things that, that we don't do is we don't stipulate a pro actually how you make the process work because organisations vary uh, and it can be from some organisations who have a very strange concept of what a volunteer is through others who use bribery like fair trade chocolate to others who have to sort of fend champions off from wanting to become involved. The only thing I would say is that we've noticed in the last two years the number of people willing to fulfil that champion's role has increased enormously. And whereas a few years back it was a bit of a struggle, to be honest, to find a core team, now it's, it's, it's a lot, lot easier in most organisations.